Hello guys, I hope that you're all safe and welcome back to our lecture on understanding issues on gender and multiculturalism. So specifically for this sub-module, we'll talk about global and local issues on gender and inequality. But more more specifically for this sub-module, we'll talk about issues revolving women and girls muna. And then we'll talk about LGBTQIA inequality related issues in the next sub-module. So let's go. The framework that we're going to use in order to unpack this lesson is uh, the Sustainable Development Goal, number five by the United Nations. And the goal is to achieve gender equality and empower all women and girls. So for this SDG, there are multiple sub-goals and we are going to see how the world and specifically the Philippines fares in terms of achieving these sub-goals. So let's go to SDG 5.1 and it says end all forms of discrimination against all women and girls everywhere. So looking at the current UN data at a global scale on the basis of the data collected across four areas of law in 2018 from 53 countries, almost a third have legal gaps in the area of overarching legal frameworks and public life. So it means that there's not so there are 53 countries that still have issues in terms of legal protection for women and girls. In the Philippines, we have a few laws that are directly or indirectly related to gender equality. The first is RA 10361, which is Domestic Workers Act of 2012 or more known as the Kasambahay Law and we know that there are more rights and privileges that Kasambahays or housemaids or house helpers have um, so that they could be more protected. You know, like for example, they should have SSS, etc. etc. And then we have RA 10354 or the Responsible Parenthood and Reproductive Health Act which we used to know as the RH Bill. So basically it, what it does is that it, it increases the accessibility of non-abortive patients, contraceptives like uh, contraceptive pills, or and then of course if the if the family um, wants to do natural family planning, um, the barangay health workers are empowered to teach families on how to do natural family planning. In short, it's just really empowering families and women more specifically in order to do proper family planning and to do birth control and to do proper birth spacing. And then we have RA9710 which is the Magna Carta for Women but basically talks about you know protection of women in the workplace and in other public spaces. And then we have the RA Anti-Violence Act against Women and Their Children Act or VAUSI, the anti-VAUSI law. And basically it increases the penalty for, uh, for offenders of women and children compared to um, if their victims were males. And then we have the RA9208, which is the anti-trafficking in persons act so because as we all know when we talk about human trafficking you know women and girls are the ones who are more likely the victims of this so this is a good law to protect more females who would most likely be falling as victims of um, trafficking human trafficking and then we have the RA8972 which is the solo parents welfare act and we know that when we talk about solo parents a large majority of them are females are mothers and uh, they should also have the the same rights as a married woman in terms of rearing for their children so there another indicator for this specific sub goal is the um, entry of women to formal education the entry of girls to formal education and as you can see in this graph you um, uh, since 2001 there is an increasing um, engagement of girls in terms of formal education which is of course better compared to other nation states so Philippines got it good but of course we want to have higher engagement for girls in terms of formal education Actually, to add to that, um, Filipino girls are more likely to finish schooling compared to uh, girls in other nation states. So let's go to SDG 5.2. 
which says eliminate all forms of violence against all women and girls in the public and private spheres, including trafficking and sexual and other types of exploitation. So globally, what have we achieved? 8% of ever partnered women and girls aged 15 to 49 have experienced some sort of physical and or sexual partner violence in the previous 12 months. The prevalence is highest in the least developed countries at 24%. So look at the intersectionality there. Um, lower income countries are more likely to have their girls experience domestic violence and sexual violence compared to higher income state counterparts. So it means that while there is a, in history there is a decrease of domestic abuse, we still have 8% of women and girls experiencing some form of physical, emotional, and sexual abuse. So now let's look at the data in the Philippines. By the way, the tables that you are seeing here is coming from the report of the Philippine Institute for Development Studies. I'm going to attach the document in this module. Anyway, so you would see here that there's a positive outcome in the Philippines because from 2008 to 2013, there is a decline in terms of the number of reported experience of physical violence and sexual violence among women. And then when you further look into the specific disaggregated data, you would see that there is a discrepancy on the number of experienced violence in rural and urban areas. So you would say in terms of you know, looking at this from an intersectional lens, that exposure to a certain type of community, whether urban or rural, exposes them to a different type of violence. Urban um, exposes them to higher levels of physical violence and rural exposes them to higher levels of sexual violence. And then when you further also look at the disaggregated data in terms of educational attainment of the women respondents, you would see that college-educated females are less likely to experience forms of abuse compared to you know, uh, those who were lesser educated compared to them. So we could say, again, from an intersectional lens, that education is a protective factor against abuse among women. So again, um, when you look into um, doing uh, rights-based approach for women equality, we have to also factor this in, that we also have to give them good education so that they can protect themselves from these abuses. So here are other information related to violence against women. First is that Philippines still follow corporal punishment, but these are more likely for boys, but still females and males are influenced by this and this could mar them physically and psychologically in the long run. And then 17% of the abuse uh, reported by children are sexual in nature. 43.8% ch of children experience some sort of cyber violence. They have been harassed online, whether emotionally or sexually. And then in times of disaster and during overseas employment, females are more likely to experience um, some sort of abuse compared to their male counterparts. Another issue is prostitution, which is illegal in the Philippines. Therefore, commercial sex workers cannot receive any form of uh, protection from the state. And most of the uh, those being peddled for sex work are females. And when the police try to enforce the law against prostitution, the ones that are mostly incriminated are the commercial sex workers and not the pimps. And then, uh, 1,008 three are trafficked per 100,000 population. 63% of those are adult women and 24% are girls. So um, human trafficking for purposes of slavery and sex work is still rampant in the Philippines. And generally, local government units have lack of knowledge or lack of implementation of VAUSI and gender and development responsibilities due to, well, one, lack of political will, two, lack of resources, number three, lack of manpower, and number four, it's just that they don't ha really have the time for it. And then we have SDG 5.3, which is to eliminate all harmful practices such as child, early, and forced marriage, and female genital mutilation. So we only have a global report for this, and uh, it says that the practice of child marriage has continued to decline around the world, although it still is present in some uh, communities. At least 200 million girls and women have been subjected to female genital mutilation 
uh, based on data from 30 countries. And however, you know, the good thing is that the rate has declined. But again, our goal is to be able to eradicate all these practices because again, one female genital mutilation has no um, physiological benefit. Um, it's really very um, physiologically and emotionally traumatic for the young girls who are undergoing it for no reason at all. At the same time, it also produces some sort of detriment for them. It can introduce some sort of infection and sepsis and can also cause a lot of blood loss among the females who are subjected to this type of mutilation. Next SDG is 5.4, which is to recognize the value of unpaid care and domestic work through the provision of public services. So uh, women devote an average roughly three times more hours a day to unpaid care and domestic work than their male counterparts. Limiting the time available for paid work or other economic productivity, education and leisure, and further reinforcing the already present gender based socioeconomic disadvantages. So again, the quantifier here is that it's unpaid. Usually, um, in most states in the world, females are assigned to do care work, to do housework, and it decreases the time that they could do in order for them to pursue an education or pursue an economic uh, productive job and therefore, you know, th this decreases their ability to be able to amass economic resources and therefore puts them in a very disadvantaged position economically compared to their male counterparts who are not assigned to do any type of housework or who is assigned less and has more time to be able to go for education or leisure or economic productive work. And then if you look at this table that uh, looks into the proportion of self-employed and unpaid family workers in total employment by sex in ASEAN member states. And then I highlighted Philippines here, but as you can see, except for Singapore, um, there are more females who are exposed to vulnerable types of employment such as self-employment and unpaid family work compared to males. No. Next, we go to SDG 5.5, which is to ensure women's full and effective participation and equal opportunities for leadership at all levels of decision-making in political, economic, and public life. So globally, women continue to be underrepresented at all levels of political leadership. The ratio of seats in the government for most states is still occupied most by men. And then 39% of the world's employment belongs to women. So again, it's lower compared to, f to males. And then 27% of managerial positions that are available are for females. So again, a large, a large three-fourths, you know, almost three-fourths of manage managers in around the world are males, okay? But proudly saying, Philippines has a better standing in terms of that specific SDG. And here are a few data visualizations to support that. The first here is that we can see that in comparing agriculture, industry, and services, females most likely dominate the service industry. Not that it's good or bad, it's just that looking at where do you find the women at work. So they're mostly in service industries in the Philippines. Next is proudly the gender wage gap in the Philippines compared to ASEAN member states is very good. As you see here, the Philippines have a negative wage gap. So what does that mean? There are times that females are paid more compared to their male counterparts. I mean, compared to, you know, Cambodia, Singapore, Myanmar, Vietnam, and Thailand. Philippines have a negative gender wage gap. So, um the pay that we provide to females is comparable to the amount that we provide for males. So that's good for the Philippines. So next here is a timeline of the difference between the wage between women and men in the Philippines from 2001 to 2014. And you can see here that the gap is not so wide. Actually, when you look into the more present time, you would see that females have a little bit more wage compared to their male counterparts. 
And then in terms of um, political life, 63.6% of national government agency employees are women. So there are more females employed in public sector compared to males. And then LGUs um, have 49 to 51% ratio, so that's almost equal. So that's a good thing, meaning that in terms of political representation, you have it good for both males and females. Now, looking at the distribution of women and men by position in 2016, you would see that there would still be a lot of male um, in the executive and the legislative department. So, feel free to pause the video if you want to peruse further the tables. So, next, we see here that from 2004 to 2016, there is an increase in terms of the percent of female candidates and elected officials in national and local elections. Um, and then you would see in terms of the secretaries in the Philippine cabinet, you would see that there, these are the numbers for the females. And then the next is the number of judges by sex. And you would see this both numbers still, males dominate this field, but Again, at least we have some sort of female representation and we can only hope that this female representation would increase through the years. Okay, this next table shows the comparison between selected Asian state in terms of the percentage of firms with female managers and with the exception of Lao PDR, the Philippines um, demonstrates a higher level of percentage in terms of private firms with female managers. However, while this number is high in the ASEAN, in the Philippines, 27%, 30% is still far from 50%. And one of the reasons why there is decreased uh, female participation in management, according to PIDS, is because of the presence of boys clubs in management. You know, uh, like frats in management. So it means that uh, they propagate this culture wherein males would more likely choose other males to be with them in the management team because they are more like-minded or probably they share same interest and leisure activities compared to females. So this boys club culture in management in the Philippines is one of the reasons why females have a difficulty in terms of penetrating into management positions in private sector. Next SDG is 5.6, which is to ensure universal access to sexual and reproductive health and reproductive rights. So globally, in 51 countries with data on the subject, only 57% of women aged 15 to 49, which is the reproductive years, married or in union, make their own decisions about sexual relations and the use of contraceptives and health services. And basically, that's how reproductive rights should be the decision making in terms of fertility the decision making in terms of having sexual activity should also involve the female and should not be unilaterally um, assigned to the males which is always seen in some communities in some countries even the philippines and when we further analyze this using an inter sectional lens you would see here in the next table that the poorest women are more likely to be exposed to unwanted pregnancies compared to the richer sectors of the country. And again, when you are in a rich sector, you have so many protective factors there. You have education, you have work, and then you have higher levels of decision making compared to a poor woman in a rural area. And therefore, there is a higher risk for unwanted pregnancies for poorer communities compared to richer ones. And then this socioeconomic class division is seen in the unmet need for family planning in terms of birth spacing and childbearing limiting, which again, the poorest are more likely to have more unmet needs compared to the richer um, sectors of society. And these are additional minor goals that the United Nations have set under SDG number five, which is first, undertake reforms to give women equal rights to economic resources such as, you know, having them own property, having them own land, you know, because in some other countries, females are not allowed to own certain properties. You know, but in the Philippines, there's not much problem in terms of that. 
Next is to enhance the use of enabling technology, in particular ICT, to promote the empowerment of women because again, there's a digital divide in terms of males and females in terms of the use, access, and benefits gained from uh, information and communication technology. And in terms of the Philippines, that's not much of a problem because there is no restrictions for females in the use of uh, ICT gadgets or ICT materials. At the same time, we have um, improved our educational system, which again, females are highly likely participating in to increase the skills and capacity of uh, people, of children, and of students in terms of ICT skills and competencies. And then the third is adopt and strengthen sound policies and enforceable legislation for the promotion of gender equality and the empowerment of all women and girls at all levels. And I already showed you in the earlier slides that we have good laws in the Philippines to promote gender equality and protect women and girls at all levels. However, always the issue in the Philippines is implementation and enforcement um, and also allocating resources and manpower and time for um, LGUs to be able to embody and, uh, and flesh all of these policies. So these are some of the things that has to be taken care of in order for us to be able to realize SDG number five. Okay, so that is the end of this specific sub-module. Our next sub-module will be discussing about LGBTQIA concerns in the Philippines. So I hope you join the discussion board that I will post uh, shortly after this module. Thank you so much. And again, stay at home and stay safe.